Thank you, Holly. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very kind uh, of Virginia New Zealand uh, to look after uh, the Timber Design Society. Good afternoon uh, to uh, all of uh, you joining us uh, today in uh, Timber Design Society's sixth uh, uh, webinar of series 2022. My name is Namir Amsu, member of uh, the TDS Management uh, Committee. This webinar is kindly sponsored by the following organizations, TDS Committee expresses its thanks and appreciation to these uh, sponsors for funding its activities. Simpson, Srontai, MyTech, Future Build, LVL and XLAM. Today's webinar is presented by Adam Jones of XLAM, and he will talk about the essentials of DFMA. He will explain everything about that. And engineering and mass timber design. A little bit about uh, Adam. Adam Jones is a DFMA uh, innovation and structural design enthusiast focused on the delivery of healthy and sustainable buildings through the use of mass timber. Adam provides market support for designing buildings that optimize for manufacturing, engineering, and assembly. He has a special interest in digital design, engineering software, and new methods, new methodologies, such as kit of paths, something new uh, construction. He will explain everything about that. We are very much uh, uh, excited uh, to hear from Adam. Uh, please post, please kindly post your brief and short questions, no more than a line or a maximum of two lines or less than two lines, please. Because if we see uh, lengthy questions, I think it will be ignored because we will not have time for that. Thank you uh, uh, very much. And again, and we look forward to see you on the 25th of August in the next TDS uh, webinar uh, by MyTech, which is MyTech Lateral Solutions. Please allow me to welcome Adam. Thank you very much. Adam, please. Thank you very much, Namir, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. So yeah, my background is as an engineer. I started in um, concrete and steel working for WSP, and then uh, did some volunteering research with Beyond Zero Emissions, which was a think tank looking at getting to zero uh, embodied carbon. So through that, that's what really led me into the um, timber area and mass timber. And uh, yeah, a lot of things I've noticed over time was, uh, you know, whereas concrete and steel truly covered a lot at university and in traditional education, whereas for mass timber, you sort of need to go out there and learn it yourself on the job, which is why uh, the New Zealand Timber Design Society is such an asset for everyone in New Zealand and around the world. So in today's presentation, we're going to be looking at a bit of a context around projects and, and where we are at today followed by DFMA Essentials. And then I'm gonna end it on Keys to Project Success, which 
covers a lot of items a bit more broadly, especially in DFMA point of view about what are the critical items to make a successful building. Um, over my career, I've been lucky to be across a lot of a lot of mass timber projects over the last uh, four or five years, but also um, hosting the Wood Solutions Timber Talks podcast. We have had over a hundred episodes now, um, and a lot of conversations on these items. So I'm going to try and distill uh, a lot of it into into this presentation. So uh, as as you're aware, there's a lot of different projects that have been delivered um, over the recent years, and with every new project, there's a new, a new team who has got more experience under their belt, making it more easier, uh, simpler to design as we go forward. So this is a, a job we delivered um, in the last few years. So Adelaide Oval Hotel and uh, hotel and apartment buildings really align well with, with mass timber, with uh, inter-party walls working as lateral stability systems and also as corridor walls in the, uh, in the secondary direction as well. Um, Cyan Innovation Building, which uh, this, this is a project that, you know, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but it just shows that the, the dichotomy we can design with mass timber. So Adelaide Oval Hotel being quite simple um, through to higher complexity and um, the type of buildings that wins architect rewards. A more of a, a common design or a common uh, building that pops up a lot is, is your commercial office buildings. So these are two coming out of, of Victoria. On the left-hand side, you've got City of Greater Geelong, so four storeys. Um, and a post and beam construction, a fully exposed structure in this case, and Bendigo Gov Hub uh, being a different building, although quite similar, but through different fire engineering approaches, you end up with a lot of plasterboard in this building as well. So it just shows um, some buildings, although look similar, you end up with a lot of exposed in one and not the other um, due to some sometimes the subjective nature of, of fire engineering. Uh, we've gone taller as well, so 10-storey apartment building. So as we're getting taller, starting to uh, work on a, a concrete core for the lateral stability system, provided it's con concentric and uh, your diaphragm loads can, can successfully uh, transfer back into the core, then um, a concrete core can really enable taller and taller buildings. And uh, this is another one in Auckland, uh, Auckland City Mission. So this is, which I'm sure you're familiar with as well, but eight storeys a CLT wall and CLT floor system here. Um, with steel connections, it, it really provides enough ductility for the seismic performance. And uh, it just gives confidence for, for buildings that are of a lesser scale when you see eight storey buildings designed well, uh, like this one. And uh, also there's a, there's a range of hybrid uh, uh, buildings that we've had experience with. So this is a commercial office in Western Australia. So here you've got a steel post and beam structure um, and a, a CLT floor plate sitting on top. So the steel, again, the, the external K braces are providing the lateral stability uh, in this building. And some um, builders and developers see this as a lesser step than a fully uh, designed mass timber building. And there's also, you do just simply get a stiffer beam than you do with glue and with steel. So you get a, um, a shallower floor to floor. So as we'll see later, uh, depending on what's requested or what's most prioritised in the building might dictate the actual over si overall system that we end up going with. And then tall buildings internationally. So Mia Stortnet, and we obviously had nothing to do with these buildings, but um, this one in Norway, you can see an external timber exoskeleton uh, ascent, which is 25 storeys in the middle there. That's two concrete cores providing the stability and Hoho -Ho Vienna, which is 24 storeys. And this is using a timber concrete composite floor deck and again, a concrete core. So as you can see, as we're going tall, we're relying on um, the strengths of other materials. And this is, I don't think you'll see in necessarily New Zealand, but <clears throat> you can certainly point to it as, as precedents around the world when you show, when you can see and put into perspective smaller steps that might be taken in, in smaller buildings. But uh, this is one going up in Western Australia. So a fully mass timber building with a concrete core uh, but it all comes down to the fire engineering strategy at, as we go taller. So you can see um, utilising plasterboard on the CLT, but exposing the glue lamb in this case, um, controlling, really controlling the fire load and helping with the compliance pathway to get a building of, of this magnitude. Uh, the second one here, C6 in, in New South Wales. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a uh, timber concrete composite deck. So you've got a CLT floor plate with uh, shear studs into the concrete deck. And for the ambient case, uh, composite action is assumed, but then for the post-fire case, the CLT can be assumed to be burnt through 
um, relying on the concrete and steel in the post fire. And thirdly, Atlassian Tower, also in, in New South Wales. So concrete core here, concrete mega columns, steel exoskeleton, and a steel uh, composite steel concrete um, mega floor every five levels. And that really compartmentalizes the fire. So at these higher scale, it's all about how, how we're controlling the fire load um, for, for obvious reasons. So there's a, there's a big push around the world um, towards mass timber. And we know all about sustainability. This is baked in as our buildings become more operationally efficient, uh, proportionally the impact from materials is, is increasing. And New Zealand is leading the way around the world in this space. Um, and Australia is, is following the footsteps of New Zealand and, and the leadership by uh, NZ. So um, there's a pathway, a clear pathway for operational emissions, but also the harder to tackle items is embodied carbon. And in the plan for New Zealand, uh, it begins with new public sector buildings reporting whole of life and body carbon, followed by all new buildings reporting whole of life and body carbon, and then slowly ratcheting um, up the requirements. So all buildings um, need to meet the embodied carbon requirement caps. And if you look at the materials on offer, cement and steel, uh, there's a industrial processes to generate a chemical reaction on the left-hand side here. And then on the right-hand side of the chemical reaction, you've got CO2 that's emitted. So it doesn't matter how much we optimize this left-hand side of the equation, you're always gonna have this minimal theoretical limit of CO2 that's emitted. You know, there is talk of green steel using hydrogen here to replace carbon, um, to strip off an oxide and byproduct of water, but really it's not, hydrogen's not available at scale. So out of all the solutions we've got on offer, it really is this chemical reaction at the bottom here, timber, where we're actually flipping it on its head and sequestering CO2 within the building material and releasing oxygen. So it, like we grow our food, we can grow our buildings and it is really the only renewable material we can use um, to meet these embodied carbon targets. And uh, the good news is previously at XLAM, um, so out of all we were it's using grid electricity, previously a lot of coal in the grid, but we have moved to 100% green power, um, meaning that we've got a significant saving on our APDs and we are looking at picking the lowest hanging fruit progressively to, to keep on improving things. And wellness, um, this is another one we know, it's, it's exposed timber, it's, it's beautiful, it's aesthetically pleasing and it's proven um, for significant benefits. So, you know, workplace satisfaction with exposed wooden surfaces is above 60% versus 20%. It's an improvement of 81% versus 47%. Satisfaction work with working life, optimism, confidence, stress levels, and uh, ability to concentrate and employees taking less sickies and so forth. So as we're trying to encourage people back into the offices, um, this research is absolute goal to show how uh, the value that can be added through using a mass timber um, uh, exposed structure. And I, I really recommend reading uh, the report by, by Pollinate to close that off. So they're the two, the triple bottom line, they're the, the two big ones we're all uh, aware of. The third one is cost. And there's probably a bit of a question mark when it comes to this. And this is really what leads me into the DFMA part of, of this discussion, because traditional thinking uh, where it's all about your, your raw materials inputs, so your concrete and your steel, it's not gonna really vary too much from the dollars per meters cubed. But when it comes to CLT, it, it does vary a lot. And it's not just all about the raw input because it is, advanced manufacturing and how it goes through that advanced manufacturing is where a lot of the costs get baked in. And it can be really the difference between a project stacking up and falling away or a project going forward and, uh, and having enough, another mass timber building in the world. So this might be, it's, this is probably a, an acronym that's uh, well, well known now, um, which will break down a bit further soon. But firstly, design for manufacture, how easy can we pump the material through the factory? Is it clogging up the factory and it takes multiple days to produce easy panels? Um, that's one item. And that price, how long it takes, uh, takes to go through the factory, that price gets passed on to the, to, the, to the material. So when we do price up a project, we do have our dollar per meter squared rate, but then we've also got a complexity rating. So if, if it's very complex panel, um, then that cost might a double your overall panel cost. So you can just see right there, the material cost of CLT is highly variable, dependent on DFM, design for manufacture. 
The second part is designed for assembly. So once we put it through the factory, ideally very easily, uh, when it gets to site, what happens then? Um, so this is where, if we're looking at to, to optimize the speed of construction as much as we possibly can, uh, how can we increase the installation rates through the right panelization, through replication, um, through designing for tolerances. So you, you know, when it arrives on site, there's no, because most of the surprises on site are gonna be tolerance issues uh, we find. And when things don't fit together, that's when things really slow down. Um, and also maximizing the hook time. Can you, with the crane, uh, lift it into place and put the minimum amount of connections to fix it in and get the crane back lifting the next element whilst people are install, uh, finishing installing the element. So these sorts of things, when you add to replication, really can optimize the, the design for assembly. And so putting those, these two together, design for manufacture and assembly, if we're optimizing for this, then the costs can come down when we're looking at it from a holistic point of view. And that's been proven to actually be cheaper. So we can deliver buildings that are more environmentally friendly, better for human health at a cheaper price. So it's really a holy trinity of, uh, of, of unlocking mass timber. So you can see here uh, a, a pie chart, a pretty arbitrary pie chart of showing how the CNC fabrication is almost as, as equal chunk as the actual raw feedstock costs of, of, uh, of the CLT. So if we're looking at DFM a bit further, designed for manufacture, and uh, we can probably understand it from the processes that goes on inside the factory and where things might be clogging, getting clogged up. So we have uh, raw feedstock coming in. So individual lamellas getting uh, cross cutted to the uh, a short lamella, which would be the secondary direction or a long lamella um, and finger jointed together to the appropriate size. Uh, after it's been cured, it moves on and gets planed, the individual feedstock, and then it gets laid up in a short direction and a long direction to create what we call billets. Uh, it's a bit like a blank canvas. And then these billets get into the probably advanced manufacturing side of things. So the Undega machine, um, and this cuts the billet billet down into smaller panels uh, based on what needs to be delivered and installed on site. So, uh, you know, at the very high level, these are the processes we need to think about um, when it comes to design. So if you look at inside the factory, remember our goal at XLAM, uh, if we're trying to get, uh, uh, so we've got the raw feedstock cost, which are fixed in, but if we're trying to optimize for design for manufacture as much as possible to get the costs down um, to make buildings stack up, uh, think about the factory flows. So we wanna be, um, our factory, they've got their own KPIs they're trying to meet every week and a certain amount of meters cubed uh, per target, per, per shift. Um, and you know, if, if those aren't met, then those costs are passed on for how much we're clogging up the factory really. So if you think about at the very start, this is where the raw feedstock begins and gets um, cut and finger jointed to size into the curing deck. I assume you can see my arrow here. Um, and then it gets, gets laid up here. So short, so long lamella followed by a short lamella laid up and, uh, and glued. And then we put it into the press. So in the press, it, it um, spends a fair bit of time here for the curing. And then after the press, the billets are taken and rolled here through to the CNC machine. Um, so, you know, sometimes the bottlenecks inside the factory appear at different places. Uh, so after it goes through the CNC machine, it, can, it needs to get lifted. And then there needs to be a QA check on every single panel. And that's where humans at, at offsite services are doing the uh, individual checks on every single panel. Um, so some buildings and some panels require different demands than others. And because of that, uh, bottlenecks appear in different places. So I'll give you two different examples now of what, what could create bottlenecks in the factory. And then um, you know, it can be applied to a wider range of, of, of items. So number one is, is panel flipping. Uh, again, it's not one of those things that kills projects, but we can add a lot of complexity into, into making panels, but we need to consciously add complexity because if we're adding costs, we need to make sure we're uh, reaping the rewards of, of, of value. Um, and if we're not getting value out of adding the cost, can we find another way to, to detail it differently um, to, to get some of the benefits? So this is probably an example of, of one of those. So you can see here, um, when it goes through the CNC machine here, the CNC machine would need to attack it from both sides uh, for the block out here on, on this side with the router and then the other side. So if you think about how this would, would happen, so it would flow the um, individual feedstock, 
through to, to lay up, through to press billets, and then it'll get to the CNC machine. If you think about the CNC machine, if we're going to flip a panel, we need to take the, the, the gantry crane, take it away from doing something else that's valuable, bring it to the CNC machine, stop the CNC machine, um, flip the panel around, the, the, the gantry crane can go somewhere else, and then the CNC machine goes back over and attacks the other side of the panel. Um, and all the while, you can imagine the billets here are starting to stack up here and clog up, and there's a bottleneck created at the CNC machine in this example. So instead, other details could be quite easy, just eliminating the need for flipping, which significantly improves our processes and reduces the costs of, of projects. That's one example. I've got another example here. So this came up for, uh, for school projects out in Victoria. Um, and these are quite simple walls that were repeated. So it was a kit of parts design where this, this, there was a lot of replication, which is a good thing for this project. But uh, you can see here these details, which were slots to allow, uh, allow some steel. Um, to, to cut these slots in, what would have to happen is you firstly get a circular saw uh, at the edges. And then the circular saw, because it's got a radius, it doesn't get to the very corners of the slot, then you need to get a chainsaw in to, to finish the work off. So that's what happens at the individual panel. But some of the challenge, challenges here occurred when we actually create the billets and turn them into panels. So if we're trying to efficiently add four panels into the one billet, um, this is sort of what it looks like and my sort of little sketch of it. Um, but the issue here is how can the CNC machine access these middle slots here to do these cuts because a circular saw, it can't get on its side and, and take out these slots to allow for the steel connections. So this is probably an example where in the factory, you know, they're not sure um, you know, in a meeting with engineer how to solve this, but because it was kit of parts and it was gonna be replicated the same detail so many times, it did warrant some further investigation um, from, from our engineers to figure out how we can improve things. And you might have thought about what the solution is already, but it's it could be quite easy because all we need to do here is uh, rather than get a chainsaw and circular saw and not access this, we'd actually have to separate every panel. So if I go back here, you'd have, here you'd have to stop the CNC machine, separate every panel, put the panel back over the CNC machine, and to get those um, middle middle joints, uh, middle slots, and then get it going. So it was an absolute nightmare to, to make these panels. Oh, the solution is super easy. Instead of doing that, we could actually get the circular saw and run it through in one process um, because it, 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 from an engineering point of view, in this case, it didn't matter if we lost more material uh, locally at the end here uh, in the, for these slots and run the circular saw through one hit. And um, we got four times manufacturing speed here. And because of that, um, those costs were passed on as savings and the project uh, uh, you know, was, was able to get up because of items like this. So back to that item of costs. So where are we sitting? So we've got sustainability and, uh, and, and biophilia baked in. So I hope you appreciate by now it's, uh, it, it is very variable, the cost. And if you think about traditional construction materials is very mature in terms of an S curve, it started at the far left. Um, you're picking, you've already picked all the lowest hanging fruit and you're climbing up the top of a 300 foot tree to, to get to the remaining fruit, which just can't be done. But luckily in the mass timber industry, we are still such a young industry in terms of the S curve. Um, and we are uh, moving up fast. And I, I believe we're quite variable now as a new technology. We're on a, a steep part of the S curve, but our cost is highly variable and, and you can get um, a building that, that is cheaper than the old technology if certain principles are followed. Which, are, which is what I'm gonna focus the rest of this um, presentation on uh, is, is some of those principles and, and with you know, a, a deep route into a DFMA perspective as well um, to actually enable a cheaper building than, than traditional. All right, so what are the keys to project success? And uh, the first one, it seems almost too obvious to, to stay, but I think it really never gets asked. asked. Uh, what is the actual objective of this of this building? What are we actually trying to do? And sometimes um, it's not it's quite broad what we're trying to achieve. We actually need to narrow down quite specifically because this will actually um, dictate what building type we're going to go with. So you know some build some developers might be I want it to be as cheap as material but get sustainability and biophilia. Fair enough. Uh, I want our building to win the, the awards like the Scion Innovation Building. 
Um, that's you know a totally different system. I don't want to be a guinea pig. That's another thing that we we hear about. Or I want to maintain open spaces. So I want to um, get the same spanning achievements that concrete buildings can get, but I want to do it with the benefits of timber. Again, that's a very different building. And same with uh, uh, developers who are just asking for smaller steps, please, away from traditional construction. So I'm going to go through a few different building systems and how, what this looks like. So remember, you know, the point here is understanding what the objective is. So if we're looking at an office building, for example, um, I'll, I'll show you some of the different building types that, that we could present um, based on what the objectives are. Now, firstly, if the developer is looking for, or the architect is trying to get as cheap uh, as traditional materials, but get the benefits of timber, you might end up with a post and beam system of about a nine by six meter grid. Um, so I've given a star rating to what these uh, attributes might have. So nine by six, you've got more columns. So you don't have the open spaces that you do for bigger spanning materials. Uh, it is very efficient from a material cost point of view. If you think about a double spanning CLT element, we're getting the benefits of continuous uh, continuous action here, which does have some vibration and some deflection um, benefits. From a DFMA point of view as well, uh, what we're doing here is we're maximizing the size of the panels. So say if, it, if, it, if your truck and um, your truck and your shipping containers are 12 meters, if our panels are 12 meters, we're not going to be having much wastage through the logistics process and transporting air. So 12 meters, perfect from a DFMA point of view uh, and also from an assembly point of view. Um, uh, also, uh, there's well-known solutions for reticulating services. So running parallel with the primary beams and then perhaps finding a, a smaller grid to run it perpendicular back to the core. We're getting the benefits of sustainability and biophilia, a lot of exposed timber here um, and a lot of, uh, well, no other materials really. So you're getting the benefits there. And then finally, uh, I'm giving it five stars for experimental because there's plenty of post and beam buildings and plenty of precedents. So the, who doesn't want to be guinea pig? They don't have to be with a, a building type like this. The second option could be a timber concrete composite um, timber hybrid. So here we're using CLT floors with a, uh, a concrete um, poured on top with a, with a mesh and um, shear connectors. And here you're getting the, a lot of benefits in this point of view because you're adding um, steel and concrete to timber, you're getting uh, the composite action. So your spanning capabilities are much greater. So your grid sizes, you, you can get that nine by nine meter grid, which is a bit closer to that concrete construction point of view. Um, material costs might be a bit, bit higher uh, for the punishment and grids. Um, DFMA, I'm giving three stars because there's additional trades on site. You're dealing with multiple materials and uh, concrete and steel is less sustainable, so, so less stars. So this would give you a different, uh, a different outcome based on what the, the questions might be. Uh, another hybrid option would be steel post and beam with, with, um, with timber on top. So you can see out in uh, West Australia, that was the building that we delivered previously. So you, you get the benefits of experimental because for some developers, it's, it's a bit closer to the traditional paradigm. We're not going a fully mass timber building. Um, we're only doing CLT floor plates which you could argue are the easiest component of CLT uh, design is just the floor component only because the connections, the glue lamb to glue lamb connections is probably where all the complexity is. And, um, you know, steel is a very mature industry when it comes to uh, connections and so forth. If we want an all timber solution, uh, but for longer grid sizes, we can look at ribbed deck systems. So you can get a nine by nine meter grid. Uh, you're going to get a punishment in terms of material costs. You're also going to get a probably a, a punishment from DFMA point of view. Um, you could tackle this intelligently to actually pre pre-assemble um, the, the ribs onto the decks uh, to, to, to make things benefit here. Um, but with a nine by nine meter grid, you might struggle to get continuous floor action uh, across double spans here. So um, you're not really optimizing that part of that point of view. But of course, you're getting huge sustainability benefits here with the CO2 sequestered. And uh, in terms of experimental, it's probably a bit more experience around Europe. There's been a few buildings I've seen uh, around Australia and New Zealand, but it's still a bit more experimental, you could say, than, than the other materials. And finally, this is uh, a, an exciting new building type and we've installed one um, already and there's one going up in New Zealand quite, quite soon. Uh, and this is a CLT band beam system. So like concrete band beams, you, you widening your beam member as much as you possibly can to, to reduce your depth. 
So you get a better floor to floor uh, height and easier services reticulation. And you can get um, decent grid spot sizes here because if you think about the band beam, we're actually shortening the span of the secondary direction. So you can get more of a seven by seven or a 7.5 by 7.5 meter uh, box grid quite easily with a, uh, a band beam system. From a material cost point of view, CLT is uh, less expensive by a fair margin compared to GLT, to be honest. If you look at just um, you know, material costs, so you get a, a fair saving with CLT buildings. There's one building we saved a million dollars um, uh, in West Australia. So I should put a caveat on save, but it's, you know, our price looked like it originally saved a million dollars on the, uh, on the updated scheme. Um, from a DFMA point of view, if uh, we're really locked into the design, we're pushing for these, these band beams to be uh, half a billet. So you're basically creating a full billet, 16 metres by, um, by say, 3.4, and then cutting it in half to have a 1.7 metre wide band beam. So it's phenomenal from a, a DFMA point of view. Um, and then finally, experimental, it's probably about three stars and, and a bit more further, further down the line. So my whole, my whole point of here is, uh, especially early days, if we're in early enough, it does come down to what the project's trying to achieve to actually what system we, we end up going with. Um, if it is from that triple pot bottom line point of view, we're trying to get uh, optimise on costs, get the benefits of sustainability and biophilia, you're probably looking at a nine by six metre grid. Um, and you know consciously, if we're trying to optimise for costs, consciously compromising in some areas compared to you would uh, for, for traditional construction. So the second big component um, is, is a bit more of a soft thing, but uh, it's all about the team and have you got a wolf pack? So what we're really finding is, is the same teams popping up again. If they've delivered a building successfully once, they can do it much easier secondly and thirdly. But other projects, um, the model that might follow is more traditional where the developer and architect uh, start the project and then they have their preferred consultants. And you know three, three out of five consultants might be uh, part of a wolf pack ready to hunt down a timber building. And then there might be one or two in that, in that group who aren't so experienced with mass timber and, um, you know, they'll find reasons not to do it. And I'm talking structural acoustics, quantity surveyors, the, the head contractor um, sometimes. So I, I think everyone in this call now is probably part of a wolf pack. They're, they're wolves ready to, to hunt down and, and um, improve buildings. But, you know, when there is a handbrake, um, <laughs> not beating my words here, it, this is really does kill projects because the reasons in, because usually what will happen, a mass timber will be put on the table and there's, there's a, you know, four to eight week period of exploring a mass timber option. Um, and in that four to eight weeks, it's critical because certain items get brought up on the agenda. And um, if there's a handbrake on there, those items won't get sold. There'll just be more and more issues that, that come up. And sometimes they're not, they're not true, some of the issues. Uh, and a lot of the time it's around compliance, it's around supply availability, because uh, if you speak directly to the supply chain, we know our compliance pathways, we know our, our, our availability and our lead times, um, and we can, we can solve all these things. So the team is absolutely critical. Um, and, you know, we think having typically wolf packs who've delivered one building, uh, install, you know, everyone supplier install a built. And when they go it again, uh, after a successful building, then, you know, the next one on and then on in, uh, they really kill it and uh, have very successful projects. A lot of the time, just the way it is, there is a learning curve on the first project. And some consultants might run that at a loss because they need to learn how to do mass timber buildings. But in doing so, they're investing for the, for the long term of uh, their availability. So with a team, um, firstly, it's designing it right. So I think there's been few different paradigms of design and I think everyone's past this first level now which was probably four years ago it's the the shoehorn approach where you start with um, traditional concrete construction and you might be able to get uh, two-way action with flat plate post-tension slabs at say 200 millimeters deep um, for, yeah seven eight meter spans both ways and then you know there might be the objective hey here's your concrete to building design in concrete and then you say can you make this timber and then you know, they'll hear someone, oh, apparently timber is cheaper and then everyone expects it to be cheaper, but you're not compromising on anything you get from concrete and steel. So that's probably where it was a while ago. Um, it's a bit like fitting a square peg in a, a round hole and you're hammering it through and it just doesn't work and it doesn't go so smoothly. 
Uh, what I'm saying level two is probably where, where things are at. Uh, a lot of successful projects are at today. And this is where you're starting with starting with the building and what the requirements are of a, of a building. So this is a, a successful project we delivered recently, Adelaide Oval Hotel, which I uh, had an image of earlier. So, you know, really goes uh, well with mass timber. Um, but the point here is form follows function. So what's the function of the building? And then you try and panelize around the function of the building in this case. So building requirements come first and then you're ex using existing procurement models. Uh, everything's fully designed um, to, to, uh, and fully coordinated. Then, you know, the supplier gets called in and say 12 weeks beforehand and then we, then we deliver to site. But third level, and this is where some projects are now and uh, perhaps going to be where it's most cost effective, is that kit of parts design uh, philosophy. So in this case, function... Um, follows form. So we're starting with, with Lego bricks, pre-designed Lego bricks that are, that are fully optimised from a DFMA point of view and have as much replication uh, in it as possible and designed to alleviate bottlenecks within the supply chain. And then we're stacking the bottle, these, these uh, Lego bricks together in these kit of, kit of parts design methodologies. Um, and with that, uh, it, a Lego brick itself looks pretty boring and bland on, it, on its surface. But when you start adding them together, you can get um, beautiful looking buildings. And if you think about our processes, uh, uh, we're, you know, the current methodology, so you design it once, build it once. This is more design it once, build it many times and borrowing a lot from the automotive industry in, in that philosophy. And if you think about the overhead per uh, metres cubed from our point of view, like shop drawing and all the processes, uh, they're pretty much eliminated if you just got it pre-designed uh, Lego bricks and, and adding that way. So, uh, you know, building 4.0, you could say, is, is heading in that direction. So, thirdly, um, is, is all about uh, as, as much standardization as, as possible. And again, you know, DFMA point of view here. So, uh, the Model T, so the, the automotive industry before the Model T took a long time to build and was very expensive. But when this came along, uh, the, the process went from 12 hours to build a car down to 93 minutes. And it was through standard parts, uh, replication within parts. And with that, you get the benefits of less chance of making mistakes. And once you build upon a single prototype, then you can optimize that prototype. So you can say, a, you know, a Lego brick is a bit like a prototype of a car here, which, which you're optimizing further. But for mass timber buildings, um, we can standardize as much as possible. I mean, we don't want uh, in most parts the, the same boring buildings that, well, you know, Beautiful buildings, even beautiful buildings can end up boring if you just repeat it too often. But standardization within the building where you can. So the same size as CLT, same size as GLT, because it all begins with billets and cuts into individual panels. Um, same with plates. Can you standardize the thicknesses throughout the building? Because it starts with billets and then they cut into plates. Uh, and also screws. Um, having the exact same screw type throughout the building, uh, whether it be, you know, maybe one partially threaded type and one fully threaded screw and then changing the spacings, but of the same screw uh, benefits things significantly. So especially from a supply chain point of view, you're, you're, you're manufacturing the one, um, one screw and you might be getting it from overseas and uh, the risk is significantly reduced because sometimes the bottleneck might be the uh, delivery of some, something as simple, simple as the screws. And then also on site, I mean, no one's gonna make mistakes if it's always the same screw. And uh, standardization of components comes from standardization of, of building demands, because if we have variability in our building demands, uh, so we've got different uh, concentrations of load throughout the building, but we're also trying to standardize the panels. If we're designing our panels to the, to the areas of the highest demand, then you're also gonna have a lot of material wastage uh, in that building and our utilization ratios aren't gonna be pushed to its fullest. So not good from a sustainability or a cost point of view there. But if we have standardized building demands with standardized parts, we can push the utilization ratio uh, for standardized components to its fullest um, and get those benefits and, and minimize overall costs. Because um, I, I know in steel, there's research out in, uh, out in Europe to show that the average utilization ratio they found was about 50%. So half the material we could say wasn't pushed to its fullest um, extent. And uh, that's something we, we want to be doing as much as possible here. So consistent spans, replication of details, obviously avoiding load transfers, which is an absolute must uh, when it comes to mass timber buildings will go a long way here. 
And then, uh, like I was saying before, standardisation of processes. So this is a kit of parts um, for schools, which was which was um, put together by by Built. And we do the shop drawing for this only once, for example, and then it's it's replicated uh, across many different building types every time. Same with the compliance pathway as well. Uh, we did a lot of fire testing for the specific details here. And uh, you know, you're not going to re repeat those testing uh, across different projects. So next part we're looking at is big parts. So uh, where, we, where we can, um, if you've got a lot of tiny panels, that means inside our factory, we need to lift every single panel uh, at offsite services at the very end. There's a QA check on every panel. That means a bottleneck might be at the very end of the factory. Um, when it comes to site, the installation rates are typically the same for a small panel or a big panel. So if you've got a lot of little panels being installed, then your, uh, then your installation rates might be you know, equal to traditional construction. But if we've got a lot of uh, less number of big panels, then our installation rates are much faster and there's gonna be no bottlenecks inside the factory. So typically um, having your grids uh, optimized to the constraints within the supply chain to allow for as big a panels as possible will enable uh, the most from a DFMA point of view. So big parts is probably a huge takeaway I'm hoping everyone takes now. So if you think about our uh, transport capability, we don't have a bottleneck shipping from Albury-Wodonga through to New Zealand, but uh, it, you know, 12 by 2.5 metres is, is typical, but we can bump it up to 16 by 3.5 metres um, with a bit of an extra cost. So you might be adding costs in terms of freight, but you're getting benefits from DFMA point of view. So typically a, uh, a cost benefit analysis might be, uh, be looked at. Now the fifth point is early supplier involvement. Um, so I've mentioned a few times where we can help, but there's a lot of nervous building surveyors around the world uh, and, and uh, things from a compliance with combustible materials. Uh, those who aren't in the timber space uh, might be a bit scared of the word combustible materials, but um, there is plenty of fire testing and understanding and knowledge of, of how these buildings work. So Grenfell Tower, of course, uh, aluminum composite cladding on the outside, no sprinklers on the inside. A lot of people died here and it was an absolute disaster. And this is repeated a few times uh, around our side of the world. So uh, firstly on projects, mapping your compliance pathways and with suppliers involvement at the very start, they know the, well, we know the, um, our, our, our fire test back to front and how we can meet the compliance of all the details within the building, whether it be the elements or at the connection, connection level as well. Um, and also our fire penetrations detailing, which have all been tested as well. So at the very start, matching your, your service penetrations to what's actually already been tested will minimise the risk that you're going to need some um, testing later in the piece. And my final point is number six is holistic costing. Uh, if we talk about some handbrakes versus wolves in, from a QS point of view, uh, a wolf um, might, might uh, do a holistic costing where you're actually factoring your prelim saving. So anything that's a dollar per week cost on site, site infrastructure, workers on site, cranes and so forth. If you're reducing the number of weeks on site, it's a, it's a pretty quick calc to work out what the cost savings are here. And that's where holistic costing needs to be priced in for buildings to stack up at the very start. Also from cranes being one fifth the weight of concrete, we get, we get significant savings from cranes. We get significant savings if you follow the load path um, from the CLT down to the uh, through the transfer structure through to the foundations um, and sometimes if, if, your, if your load is a limiting factor it enables buildings that weren't previously uh, available which was the case in terms of uh, the, build, the building on screen here. And finally holistic costing it values it right so I think uh, is it cheaper than concrete is it cheaper than concrete is a lot of the time the focus uh, but it's, it's like saying is a Nokia phone uh, cheaper than an iPhone 10, or is it uh, this holiday where this lad here is, uh, is tents blown away out in the middle of nowhere, is cheaper than a beautiful holiday in, in Tah Tahiti? Or it's like saying a, a normal building, traditional construction is cheaper than mass timber. You're actually getting a totally different product at the very end. And uh, this does spill into improved rental yields, for example. So even if it does cost question, and you throw in some conservative numbers and it costs a little bit more, um, you do get a payback period from a differential value of the, the products that you actually end up with. So uh, yeah, in terms of literature available, uh, you can you can contact us. We've got a, we've been in operation for over ten years now, um, and with that, a lot of our processes have been put into 
design guides, our learning. So there's a lot to learn from our design guides. Um, and uh, I recommend checking that out. And uh, yeah, you can also contact us at XLAM through the website. And um, we've got a, 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 a quite well-oiled machine now, I'd say, in terms of the, from the BD team, uh, technical and in-house design services and our project management team as well. So um, really appreciate everyone's time today and happy to, to take on any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. That was really a very uh, thorough and detailed uh, talk about uh, CLT manufacturing, uh, designing, uh, uh, detailing, and construction from all perspectives. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now, uh, I'll pass on to uh, Holly. She will uh, handle the questions and answers. And please, once again, I uh, uh, kindly ask uh, short and brief questions so we can manage as much as we can of questions. Holly, please, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. I'm obviously not Holly. I'm Daniel Moroder from PTL. Um, so Holly has asked thank me. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, a good surprise. No, no problem. Holly asked me uh, to jump in uh, to ask the question. Um, I'm happy to do so. Um, Adam, thank you very much for joining the webinar um, and speaking on behalf of Islam, who's obviously a sponsor also of the Timber Design Society. So it's great to have you on board. We really enjoyed your talk, especially the part about the standardization, uh, obviously the carbon aspects and, and also the, um, the team approaches. It's quite important we found it as well. Um, I might have another question later to you, but let's first ask the audience. Um, so we have a question from John. Um, he's asking about any risk of glue failure during the press. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So I'd say uh, no, it all, it all gets picked up at, um, at the very end when we do, we do, uh, we, we actually get that in a, every billet, we, we pump it up with uh, moisture to get it way past the saturation point and then um, and then and, and dry it out. So, you know, the glue line integrity or the glue line from that perspective, it's fully, um, it's fully tested at that point of view. So uh, we, you know, when we, whenever we experiment with new things, sometimes there might be some initial, uh, initial challenges there with the press and working out how the glue line works. But um, now, we're, you know, from a manufacturing point of view, we're, we're, you know, exactly how it reacts with our panels and um, yeah, it's a well, well, well oiled machine from that point of view. And but I imagine you're doing uh, commonly the lamination testing um, to also make sure there's no issue with that. That's right, yeah. And uh, there's another question, um, which is about the ductility of CLT. Yeah, so I might start with this and then Daniel, I've seen, I think you're one of the experts uh, in, in more seismic point of view, but uh, obviously CLT is a brittle element and you actually you connect it with the, the steel connectors um, in between. So it's really a steel to steel connection that's that's uh, doing most of the work um, from a seismic point of view. Um, Daniel, do you want to talk a bit further about this? <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. It's the, the timber itself or CLT itself is, is not ductile as such. It's actually quite a brittle material um, and as such needs to be designed for our, as a capacity protected element. Uh, and it's a connection. So yeah, it's the hold downs or it's the splices which provide the ductility. And yeah, it's something an engineer needs to properly look at in terms of choose a design activity, design for it, and then make sure that the, the connection can provide that, that activity. Um, yeah, I also would like to say that the new standard, the new timber design standard is about to be published in the next couple of weeks or, or months. And there will be much more guidance in terms of seismic um, design on, on timber structures, which also includes um, CLT. Mm. Right. Um, Another question we have here from Garrett is, how do you fix the timber flow cassettes to achieve diaphragm action? So it, I guess it's more about the, the splicing of the CLT panels or cassettes. Yeah, so um, uh, for the ribs, the ribs deck, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, is referring to. So you could, you can um, connect them together with, with glue and or, or screws to get that, that full connection um, for, to help with the diaphragm action. So. Uh, yeah, you can get that composite action to, to make it working as, as, as one unit. 
if if I may add, Adam, um, yeah. gluing is definitely an option, but um, I I would recommend to still add uh, metallic fasteners because although we we should design diaphragms for elastic, there's always a risk that the force is getting bigger, and yeah, side gluing might not be the best idea. So I would recommend splicing the panels, um, the CFT directly with a spline or half lap, or if you have cassettes to splice the potential joists together. So I don't know the specific project, but there's different different ways, um, but Screws, nails up, obviously, always a good, good yeah. idea. So there's another question. Um, let me read it out. Do you prepare a bill of quantities similar to traditional construction? And what is your take on the role of quantity surveyors in the DFMA uh, process? Yeah, so we, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, in our pricing, we'll have uh, our per meter squared rate, and then we'll itemize all the additional items. So. So things like treatment or, or the, the visual grade material, we won't you know, include things up to installation rates. So there'll be a lot of, and we'll up at the very start, we'll have um, some uh, nominal assumptions around the fixings, pricings and all that. So that's what we'll include at the very start. Uh, we'll, we'll start with the three levels of pricing really. At the very beginning, it's very low clarity, rough back of the envelope type, type numbers, which are based on previous projects which is typically what's required to know if it's going to stack up or not. And then, you know, all the way through to it, to the uh, final uh, quotation stage. So I think, I think from a QS point of view, it, it comes down to, uh, you know, we, we can go to the, the, the individual material, but we, at, we currently don't actually, uh, you know, fully price up the benefits of holistic pricing in terms of program savings. So I think um, it's up to the, the quantities today is to work out in detail uh, where we're more expensive and prices in where we're more expensive. But if we're doing that, making sure uh, where we're getting all those savings and actually price that in accordingly as well. So I think that's where the, the QS can come in is, is that back end. Thank you, Adam. Um, there's another question from Ty about um, the, what, what are the structural design tools in terms of software, which are recommended and mostly used in the, in the industry? From from Islam's perspective, yeah, I'd say uh, from an analysis point of view. So analysis being where most of it is, uh, uh, traditional models like uh, e tabs and whatnot. It's not as uh, appropriate we think because it's um, you know CLT has got stiffness and strength in, in both directions, and uh, so we we prefer global RFEM with the RFEM uh, laminate module inserted into it. Um, with that, it actually does work out the individual layups as well, because which is really important. If you think about we've got MGP 10 grade on the outside and MGP 6 on the inner going in that secondary direction, that secondary direction really needs to be to be looked at, uh, which which RFEM laminate can do. And then from a design point of view, it's um, you know, I think most firms are developing up their own processes and tools to be actually tackle the design uh, the ways they they want to do. Um, and then you know different methods around the world. It's because well the New Zealand is a new standard coming out. I'm interested to know how much it tackles um you know CLT as well. It will tackle a lot of timber. So CL, CLT it's still it, it's still like you I mean the question is do you borrow from Europe? Do you borrow from North America? Um, from that from that point we we probably internally borrow a lot from uh, North America as a starting point and then find the gaps. And fill in the gaps with with Europe. That's just our our strategy. Um, so that's sheer analogy method, um, which we'd go with. And then you know Europe, it's probably really strong from a fire point of view as well. Uh, Eurocode, I think. So you know, being that's a benefit being our side of the world. We can sort of cherry pick some things a little bit as well, which is most appropriate. Do you have anything to add, Daniel? Yeah, um, I would like to add. So RFM is is a software from the Global Software Warehouse, which is based out of uh, Germany. And yeah, they they're strong in all materials, but they have a strong focus on timber. And uh, we, we also use the software in our office here at PTL. Um, the other thing I would like to add: the Canadian Wood Handbook, um, as well as the Proholz guideline, they all have chapters in terms of modeling. And FB Innovations out of Canada is about to release a handbook about modeling of timber structures. It will be released, I think, September, if I'm not uh, if I'm correct. And it will answer a lot of those questions. And yes, software houses are slowly upskilling or upgrading their software um, to help us designers design or model um, timber buildings. So we have a few uh, treatment durability questions. Adam, uh, one question is what, what kind of treatment is available for the 
Ixlam CFD panels. Yeah, so we can uh, uh, to H to get it to H three point two or H three three treatment. So that's where we get um fully penetrate the, the feedstock uh, at the individual feedstock level, and then um, and then make the CLT panels out of all the individual treated feedstocks. So it's quite a robust strategy, and it, it covers from a yeah uh, from a termite point of view as well. It covers as well as uh, as uh, mold and fungal growth. So um, yeah, between the two, it, it, it helps a lot. And uh, yeah, if there's any specific information, more of the chemicals used at that level, uh, feel free to get in touch and I can send you a um, product statement on that. Thank you, Adam. Um, similar question in terms of durability now is, what about the durability of the glue, um, the one you're using for the CFE panels? Yeah, so it's, well, glue glues in general that, I mean, that deep, delamination test we do which I was mentioning before which really does model it through when you pump it out with moisture and it expands um, as much as it it, it it swells up as much as it possibly can and then you actually shrink it all the way back down that is going to be is that really does test the, the glue line from a durability point of view for as long as it, it possibly can um, and there has been engineered wood products for a fair while now so you know not just not CLT but other engineered wood products that have got a long enough uh, designed in service and glues hasn't been really uh, an issue um, from that point of view in terms of time. And uh, I think I think my understanding is that uh, all glues are being um, like there's a guarantee that they last to 50 years as required described by the by the New Zealand building code. And I think it's the same in Australia. So I think there's yeah. enough assurance that the glues are, are working. Yeah, that's out. it. We do provide provide that uh, assurance. Thank you. Um, Here's another question. Um, can you expand more on um, avoiding load transfer? What is your definition of load transfer and why do you want to avoid it? Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. It might be different for different people, but I'm um, talking about the load, the load parts as you got the building. So say for an apartment building, a uh, you know, in concrete construction, you could just go get away with blade columns as you go up. So that means you got a lot of architectural flexibility. So changing um, the walls everywhere. But with, with timber walls, we typically think uh, lining them as much as you can up the building and not actually having a, you know, a load at mid support to actually transfer it back into the, the vertical load path. So, um, yeah, that's what, I was, uh, that's what I was referring to. It can, it's one of those things that can be done, but uh, it does add a lot more complexity, probably disproportionately compared to traditional um, materials. Thank you, Adam. Um, there's another question by Michael. Um, is there a cost premium for small projects which have a small volume of CLT, for example, single family residential um, buildings? Uh, no, we, we, won't, we won't put, you know, a, in our spreadsheet, it's the two things. You've got the, the panel rate and the complexity of the individual panel. So we won't go to a third level and say, oh, it's a small building, let's punish it. Uh, you know, having said that, you probably are going to pay a, a premium for a small residential building with CLT, just the volume of wood that you're using uh, compared to say light frame construction. If you think about our panel of CL390 uh, CL panel, which is a solid a solid panel. So just think about the amount of timber that's going into there. Um, so yeah, we won't punish it. It just might naturally get punished and sometimes residential projects are more, uh, more complex if, it, if we're trying to um, you know, do some interesting things with it, which is, you know, really, really cool. And if that's the goal of a project to actually make a beautiful looking, you know, residential building and you're happy to pay a premium, then that absolutely can be done. But if we're trying to do uh, cost efficiency, then um, just sim simple is, is always the, the key. Thank you, Adam. Um, another question we have here, uh, how do you analyze vibration point loads and deflections? Uh, so I'm guessing there are three different ones. So vib vibration, you've got um, is obviously simplified checks around the world, which is probably your first point of call for a quick, quick design. Um, and there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. Uh, I'll probably lean to FP Innovations one again, which uh, it's very simple. It's an extremely simple check, and it's just based on the stiffness of the panel. But what it does do is it takes into account the stiffness of this, the supporting member. Because um, sometimes if you just look at the, the CLT panel in isolation, uh, it's actually it might be the glue lamb member that governs the design. So your glue lamb member needs to be stiff enough 
there. And I think the FP innovation simplified vibration check, looking at both elements as a system, um, uh, does it the best. And then uh, then you've obviously got your more complex um, FEM type type approaches, which can be done. And uh, you know that's akin to traditional materials. So working out your, your frequency and doing your um, modal analysis uh, uh, through the FEM process as well, which uh, I believe RFEM um, has, a, has a new module over the last 12 months as well, which uh, can be done. So you can do all of your more complex CLT design inside of RFEM under that global um, ecosystem. Um, also, uh there is a technical note uh, part of the timber design journal which talks about vibration. It also covers um, CLT, so that might be another port of call. It's available on the on the timber design society webpage if if people are interested in, in looking at that. Um, so there's another question about the software. So uh, could a layer shell element in ETAPs be used to model CLT floors? This being used with elastic materials oriented, representing the different thickness and directions of the CLT layers. Um, Adam, do you want to answer that, or I can also? Uh, yeah, I might. I might let you have a go at that one, Daniel. Uh, I think. I think my my surface answer would be yes. I mean, if you go to that extra level of detail and and thought to actually model the um in both individual nullers in in both directions, maybe you can get to that to that level, and it might be okay. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, it's, it's my take. You can. I haven't done it myself simply because we, we prefer using the RF laminate or RFM software, but it can be done. The question is more, what, what's the aim? Is it diaphragm stiffness or is for in-plane stiffness or is it out-of-plane stiffness? Um, for in-plane stiffness, um, there's different ways to model. And again, there's a similar technical note on the Timber Design Journal uh, part of our webpage, which discusses uh, in-plane stiffness. For out of plane, it could be modeled, um, or you could also use a solid plate and just fudge the out of plane stiffness. Um, there's many many ways to skin the cat, uh, as you as you can say. So there's different ways, but I'm pretty sure ETAPs can be used. The difference is that RF, RF, RFM sorry has a module which does the um, orientation and thicknesses and stiffness values automatically. Um, that's another... uh, I'm happy. I'm lucky. I add you on, Daniel. Come on and last. <laughs> I'm sharing a couple of you as well. Yes, yeah, so, so, not not. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, hopefully, not seeing your show. No, but... no, absolutely not. I, I, I no, totally respect happy. your experience. So I'm happy to refer to something. Happy to provide my my input on that. I mean, uh, it, it's um, so, some. It, it's definitely one of the core businesses we are doing in terms of working with uh, timber and, and CLT. So happy really? to share my experience with. It. Um, there's a, a very good question. Uh, I probably know the answer, but I'll let you answer it. Have you ever integrated mechanical electrical services into the DFMA design? For example, floor cassettes arrive on site with services pre installed to reduce site time. Uh, well, we, we already baked into the processes is, uh, is the CNC machine having everything um, cut out of the, the actual panels to allow everything to be installed um, easily on on site, so it does enable that you know, rapid um, follow-up trades to, to install services. And there are some third-party uh, fabricators who are adding those that extra value um, in some cases. Uh, so you know there is a few getting to that, and especially from a modular, so you know two D panelized uh, point of view, but getting into that three D modular space as well. There's, there's third parties moving into both spaces, and um, and there's uh, yeah there's value in and and reasons behind behind both um, particularly around say bathroom pods for example where you're not actually transporting so much space and uh, you, you, you're transforming a lot of uh, pre-designed value in, inside the one pod thank you Adam um, there's another question from Sandeep uh, from a wellness point of view what is the impact of timber protection coatings on the health of the people using the building uh, in terms of the, so there, there are always requirements in terms of, so in terms of the, the CLT itself, uh, there's VOC, low VOC, but in the glue is the, the big one. The actual coatings themselves, um, uh, I believe don't, don't have any impact. I mean, everything does have quite, um, quite stringent requirements that you need to meet to be act, to actually, um, be a surface coating on timber products for, 
the end use case of a building. Um, but yeah, you know, whatever the encoding is, they could have uh, uh, assistance in that case. So, you know, Cabots, for example, they do have um, a lot of product information on that to, to, uh, to help with that one. So we have two last questions. They're probably a bit more technical. Um, there's one question about a CLT and diaphragm. So can CLT act as a diaphragm and how can it be designed to resist seismic action? Yeah, so it's it's like uh, in so like we talked before about in-plane loading. Uh, you can have in-plane loading as a shear wall or as a diaphragm. It's quite a similar just mechanism how it's actually working. Uh, there's, there's four components to, to break down. You've got your in-plane in bending of the panel itself and the shear rigidity of the panel. And if uh, you calculate that, you'll find that it's it's so stiff as a percentage, it's not really um, moving much at all, but your connections, so your hold downs actually holding it back in tension or whatever your connection system might be, or uh, your shear connectors like your you know WBR brackets from, from a rather blast or something, providing your, your shear um, stiffness. And you know your, your steel connection's got a bit of slip and it's also got um, you know, ductility. So when, it, when the whole building's moving, the panel itself is going to be strong and stiff and, and the connections is where it's going to be at. So uh, yeah, sometimes uh, your, your traditional half laps or your spline joints may, may be enough. Sometimes it might not be. You might need a lot more steel uh, as well to actually do that, um, to transfer from one panel to the next from a diaphragm point of view. And uh, and that's probably one of those areas where be careful where we're putting steel and DFMA items we were talking about before. A panel flipping, uh, where are we putting the steel, making sure we're attacking the one side of the panel and not two and, and so forth. Because it's a lot of the time it is the steel uh, detailing that we're allowing for in the panels, which um, could, could clog up the factory. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adam. And um, for the order asked the question, I encourage you to have a look at this uh, technical note about the diaphragm design with CLT, which uh, goes into modeling rather than design, but it, it's kind of goes hand in hand. Um, another question we have is how many stories max can we go with, with this? I imagine with, with CLT, and what's the maximum ductility we can um, use in our structural system? Yeah, so for the, for the first, uh, so how many stories? Well, a LAS unit, there's pretty much the sky is the limit if you're using concrete and steel as your primary lateral stability system. So using the high rise functions. And as I showed before, there is uh, huge buildings um, going up and we've got a few more coming across our desk where it's just um, the CLT. It's, it's, you know, say if you've got concrete band beams with CLT in field panels, your CLT is not really doing much in terms of diaphragm point of view either at those higher levels. So your, your diaphragm is probably gonna be a limiting factor of the CLC floors as you go taller and getting it back into your primary lateral stability system. Um, so yeah, the sky's the limit. Using a pure CLT building, uh, it seems to be that seven to, you know, seven to 10 stories is, is uh, what's been done. So maybe you can push it a bit further than that for, for an office building, for hotel buildings, you know, might be, might be quite similar. Um, but at a point, you're starting to get crushing of crushing issues at, as you go taller and you might need uh, strengthening. So the actual floor-to-floor -floor junctions for hotels and apartment buildings um, do change based on the different loads you get uh, and same with office building. So, you know, pure timber, probably seven to 10 stories sort of thing. I tend to agree and I think the difference is also if it's in Oakland, probably 10 is, is achievable. If it's more like a Wellington-based building, then perhaps uh, yeah, six to seven is more, more coherent. Um, yeah, sorry, I was taught, <laughs> that's a good point. From a seismic point of view, uh, yeah, we saw Auckland City Mission for a pure, so I was talking about um, around the world, so seismic wise, it's yeah, very different story, but Auckland City Mission, we got an eight story, a lot of mass timber, um, you know, quite easily. So maybe at that height, it's uh, more appropriate in seismic regions. Yeah. The, the second part of the question was about ductility and uh, it's always my opinion uh, it's always difficult to, to, to provide a value it, it depends on the structural system and the deflections and everything so I think anything between two two and a half is achievable if you want to push it to three could be done but we need, we need to make sure that the actual ductile link can handle it so that the connections need to be checked um, so it's not it's a it's a essentially you choose a, um, a ductility 
capacity, but you need to make sure it, it can be achieved. So it's it, it's a sim it, it's not as simple as giving a value, uh, in, in my opinion. So Adam, very last question, and then I let you go. Um, what glues are being used to, um, for the CLT panels, and how is it manufactured, please? So <laughs> yeah, poly we use uh, polyurethane glue. Uh, we it's um, so there's, there's two components. You've got the glue itself and I believe a, a, a catalyst. I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the exact manufacturing process. I know about it when it arrives at our factory and uh, we start using it. Um, so, I mean, I can provide more information on that. But yeah, it's, it's a PU glue. Um, yeah, it's well known and, and tested and that's what we use all of our fire testing and everything too as, as well to determine the FRL. So I, I, I wonder if the manufacturing question was about how the CFT is manufactured. So I don't know if you want to provide just a few words. I don't know. It's just my guess. Oh, um, how's the CLT manufactured? Okay. So yeah, you, you get um, you, at the layup. So we get individual lamellas and then we go 90 de degree angles to each other. And we do a glue, the glue layer in between. And then from that, it goes into a press where we make um, big billets, a bit like that blank canvas analogy. That was using so you know you're basically gluing individual lamellas at 90 degree angles uh and you know we use lower grade on the inside and then yeah that's taken to the cnc machine where we create panels thank you adam and everyone for joining in um adam thanks for making time that, that was great and and i wonder if you should do a, a technical in terms of uh, how it's actually being modeled and designed in the near future yeah something we can investigate absolutely okay. Thanks for your insights. It's, it's good to have um, suppliers' perspective to the design of timber buildings. And also have to say thanks to, to you, your team, over the last 10 years, you have really contributed to the way we design uh, mass timber structures in New Zealand and Australia, obviously. So thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. I hope you found it interesting. And obviously, also a big thank to Holly in the background and Namir for doing the introductions and um, following throughout the, uh, the webinar. Thanks everyone and see you in about a month's time for the next webinar. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much everyone. See you later. Cheers, bye-bye.